1974, uh, my best man, who was also a science teacher from Calgary, uh, he and his wife were up visiting uh, my wife and myself, and I decided to take them both here to uh, have a wiener roast or something out here. That was the Labor Day weekend in 1974. And so we came out here to the band and we both decided, oh, well, let's go just check it out a little further. So within a couple of hundred uh, paces, we had uh, seen some rib fragments in, in the creek bed, a number of them. So we checked them out and they weren't weathered or certainly not significantly. And therefore, they couldn't have traveled that far. I mean, when you look upstream, there's nothing there. So they had to be here. So I clambered up this cliff that you're seeing here and uh, I could see where the slope was changing and where it was changing. I saw uh, some rib fragments, some vertebra, uh, part of a femur, and so it was really quite promising. And then I thought, well, maybe I should check if there's anything more showing. Didn't take long, first shovel full, and I hit something clang, and I thought, see, this rock, I didn't, look, didn't expect to see rock right here. So I pushed it off, and it didn't look like rock, it was bone. <laughs> And at that time, I didn't realize what a rich uh, fossil bed was. And so I had no concept whether this was unusual or not. Because all of this in one place, that's really quite significant. But uh, I never dawned on how significant. <laughs> never dawned on me. Al's discovery was bigger than him. He was no expert, just a teacher with a hobby, but his discovery would upend his life, alter the history of his hometown, and change the course of paleontology. I'm Tara Cooper, and this is Follow the Bones. was a guide to Al's story, someone who knew the science behind his discovery, a real bona fide expert. And if you're looking for paleontologists, there's no better place than Dinosaur Provincial Park. My guides Phil Curry and Eva Kopelhaus are kind of a big deal, real heavy hitters in the paleo world, and I'm lucky that they've invited me along. Phil and Eva are scientific collaborators, but they're also married and you can tell that they're best friends. When I was a kid I grew up with parents that worked together. My mom and dad really had a, a fantastic life because they, they worked together but they weren't working on the same stuff. They were complimenting each other. I thought that was, that was really nice and when I first got married I thought that I had found something like that but it didn't quite pan out and uh, later on in life when I met Phil I realized that maybe I would have a second chance of finding somebody who I could work with and we don't work on the same kind of fossils but I think we complement each other really well in that sense. I am the one who is dealing with a million small details to be able to do the research right. It's uh, there's. There's never an easy way. There's a lot of things that needs to be done all the time and and we do what we can to make it happen. <laughs> In camp, Eva's the boss, but she's also a hotshot scientist. I didn't even know what a paleobotanist was until I met Eva. A paleobotanist uh, study fossil plants. And a lot of people don't know that plant material fossilized so well and keep so long and uh, are still so beautiful. 
generally I think uh, there's not enough attention paid to the environment surrounding the dinosaurs. If you think about it in this way, there would not, not have been any dinosaurs if it wasn't for the plants. It's, uh, and if you go to a natural history museum, there's never paid too much attention to the vegetation in you know those times going back. And in reality, it's really important to know something about what they lived in and what we what they ate and so on. But um, I'm working on it. <laughs> I want to see a change in, in how uh, that is done because I think there's a lot of interesting stuff. And then there's Phil Curry. He's a highly respected paleontologist, known all around the world. He's a professor at the University of Alberta and was the first curator at the T-Rail Dinosaur Museum. But he's also humble and kind and in really good shape. Uh, like a lot of kids, I got interested in dinosaurs. Um through toys, actually. Uh, I opened a box of cereal one day and there was a toy dinosaur inside and the toy dinosaur uh, was one of a series and I spent the next X number of months looking for the Tyrannosaurus Rex in that series. And uh, I had to eat every box of cereal that I opened <laughs> before my mother would buy another box of cereal. <laughs> So uh, um, I owe a lot to Rice Krispies in terms of the origin of my interest in dinosaurs. However, it was only about five years later when I read a book by Roy Chapman Andrews called All About Dinosaurs. And the book was, in fact, uh, more about being a paleontologist than it was about dinosaurs. So by the time I was 12 years old, I knew that all the Canadian dinosaurs came from Alberta and my ambitions extended to the fact that I would not only be a dinosaur paleontologist, thanks to Roy Chapman Andrews, but I would also be a dinosaur paleontologist who worked in Alberta. And uh, much to my surprise, I ended up getting a job in Alberta, exactly where I wanted to be and doing exactly what I wanted to do. So I was a very lucky person, but on the other hand, I always knew exactly what I wanted to do. <laughs> I wake up early. It's calm and quiet on the Red Deer River. Phil and Eva's camp is totally off the grid, with no cell reception, running water, or toilets. We're in Dinosaur Provincial Park on the north side of the river, near our camp at Happy Jacks. The biggest problem with Dinosaur Provincial Park, and I recognize this from the first time I ever came here, is, is just that it's so incredibly rich, and there's just so much here. It offers challenges that very few other places in the world have. The silence in camp is refreshing. It's a perfect day for digging. As a first timer, I ask Eva what I can expect. Field work can be very diverse. Is that the right way of saying it? <laughs> it can go from more than plus 40 on, on the hot days to suddenly zero degrees or even lower. It always seems like when we have a day like today that <sighs> It'll never be bad weather again, but boy, <laughs> it'll come. <laughs> There's no, no doubt in my mind that we are always sort of fooled by the good days. Our group hikes out of the valley to the dig site, about 5K. Everyone's eager and the pace is fast. I'm already starting to fall behind. specimen is very large and um, I think would be intimidating to a lot of crews because you've got a skull that's more than a meter long by itself and the bigger the dinosaur it is the more of a challenge it is and I think you have to have the right attitude to take these things on. I decide to go for a walk. I'm warned not to stray too far. 
to watch out for rattlesnakes, sinkholes, quicksand, and stay hydrated. But my biggest fear is getting lost. I can't help but step on bone. Little ribs, teeth, large vertebrae, they're everywhere. There are a lot of dead animals underfoot, and the quiet reminds me of a graveyard. We have people who come in and try it, but don't like it because it's dirty and you have to sit still and uh, you have to be slow and, you know, all these things are not everybody's cup of tea. But they wouldn't necessarily know until they try it because it sounds really romantic and interesting, but oh, it is hot and oh, it is dirty. I don't mind so much uh, the dirty part, but... Now and then it's nice to get out and have a shower and, you know, <laughs> get, get normalized again. The largest block on this thing uh, weighs at least two tons. So the fact that we even just have to turn the specimen over without losing the specimen by collapsing underneath as you turn it over uh, is of course uh, only possible because of the fact that uh, it's been done many times before and we have the experience of others to draw on and of course we have our own experience. Uh, my very first dinosaur um, didn't fare so well <laughs> uh, when we tried to chain, turn over a block that was uh, about the same size. Uh, in fact, the rock was soft enough uh, below that it collapsed in the middle and uh, several of the bones were destroyed and that was really disheartening. Okay, are we ready for the real thing? Yes. 100% now. Let's do it. There. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. For the pie bar, really yeah, yeah. to get yeah. that edge out. Cause yeah. Yeah. And all feet away. All feet, stay away. Three, two, one. Perfect. Keep going, keep going. Okay, push. Feet clear. Once flipped, the team is so tired they almost forget to celebrate. Most of the team takes a break. After all, it's a big day with much accomplished. But I noticed Phil taking notes. Even after all that hard work, he still has the stamina to document the dig. And this is why he's so respected. I noticed that he always has a field book on hand. And it turns out that this diligent note taking would wind up saving Al's discovery. Back at camp, Phil gives me a crash course in the history of paleontology. It's not a linear progression, but starts, stops, and then giant leaps forward. The, the first golden age of dinosaur collecting really was in the uh, period around 1900, just before 1900 and for another 10 to 20 years after that. But with the Second World War, with the First World War, with the Great Depression, we saw a suppression of money available for scientific research, all kinds of scientific research. During that long period, very, very few people worked on dinosaurs. In fact, it may have been as few as six people worldwide who were paid to work on dinosaurs. That's how bad it had got. The 1970s, however, uh, were a time when new dinosaurs were being discovered all over the world, and this is a time where the dinosaur renaissance really got its start. Early on, most paleontologists were in fact trained as geologists, and um, they tended to think of dinosaurs as, well, this isn't entirely fair, but uh, interesting rocks would be one way of looking at it. In the 1970s, though, the people who were interested in dinosaurs were mostly biologists, and they were interested in dinosaurs as animals. And because of that, they started to um, make comparisons with living animals, and to imagine what dinosaurs may have been like as living animals. And consequently, they started making discoveries about things that uh, we hadn't really thought about before. Uh, were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? 
were dinosaurs the ancestors of birds? Were dinosaurs, in fact, not as stupid as we thought they were, and that some of them may have had intelligence? And did dinosaurs, in fact, move in herds? And really, it was that aspect of it that I came in on in the 1970s, because um, around that time, I had started working in Dinosaur Provincial Park. After decades of neglect, the paleo world burst open, led by grad students just like Phil. And at the very same time that Phil was exploring Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta South, Al was wandering a creek bed north near Grand Prairie, hunting for fossils. It would take years and years, though, before their paths would cross. I pack up camp and arrange to meet Phil, Eva, and Al at Pipestone Creek, 900 kilometers to the north. In the 1970s, uh, because of this increase in interest in dinosaurs that uh, came with the dinosaur renaissance, um, there was a school teacher looking for dinosaur bones near Grand Prairie. And he found bones lining the creek, essentially, and he followed them up the creek until the bones disappeared. And then he realized, well, the bones must be coming out of the cliff right here. And so he climbed up, and sure enough, he found the layer that the bones were coming from. And at that time, he wasn't sure, of course, what kind of bones those were, but he would come with his friends and on the weekends and so on, he would collect more, and uh, he made a pretty substantial collection. And I accumulated several tons of material, and that was just in one year. I lugged it all out on my back, backpack, <laughs> which is why I think I've got back problems now. So in a single year, Al discovered and removed tons of bones his basement completely full of them. But his discovery, and even his identity as a citizen scientist, would all soon come crashing down. Rumors of big finds circulate in town. Sites are kept secret, buried at night, but poachers and vandals move in. The artifacts are in danger, so the government bans all amateur rock hounds. Good intentions or bad intentions, doesn't matter. No credentials, no digging. I was notified that I could no longer get a permit because I was not a paleontologist and I was not affiliated with, with an institution that had a paleontologist on staff. Until I was, I couldn't remove anything. But I did uh, continue uh, excavating and uh, uh, after a time I was told that I really could not continue because uh, of the regulations and I got a uh, what I think a 17 page document uh, with all of the rewritten material and so uh, I was really quite annoyed at that time because uh, and I still didn't know what what it was what kind of a dinosaur it was I didn't know anything about it other than the fact that it was a dinosaur. Al was devastated angry and frustrated that nobody seemed to care about all of his efforts. He wanted the bones gone. He wanted to move on with his life. So what do I do with all the, uh, the bone that I had? Well, I decided to donate it to the local museum. And I did, and that was not maybe such a good idea because it just sat there. No one knew what to do with it and whatnot. There were just too many bones for a small town museum to deal with and plans were made to dump Al's collection in a landfill. Yeah, I, I was a very unhappy man at that time, and I uh, was got to the point where I didn't want to cooperate with them anymore because they, anything I tried to do, there was another obstacle put in my way. All that hard work for nothing. The discovery was slipping away, and still no one knew what Al had found. So Al finds the bones in 74 and was shut down in 76, his collection gathering dust in the back of a rinky-dink little museum. 
But in 1979, a young up-and-coming paleontologist named Philip J. Curry was passing through Grand Prairie and popped into the local museum at lunch. I had heard about uh, this discovery and so stopped and look at, looked at his collection of bones. And I could tell right away it was a ceratopsian dinosaur, but I couldn't tell what ceratopsian dinosaur it was. Phil made a one-sentence note about Al's collection in three tiny drawings. And then he left, back on the road and the long drive to the Tural Museum far to the south. Turns out Al's collection wasn't saved after all. As I was leaving Grand Prairie, Al told me about Darren, a paleotechnician who works at the Tyrell Museum in Drumheller. Al said that Darren was the real hero of his story, the one who initially put two and two together. Drumheller is all about dinosaurs. You can order a dino burger, visit a not exactly to scale T-Rex, and buy a fossil. In other words, it's your typical tourist town. But the real attraction is the Tyrell. It's a classic natural history museum with dioramas, a visible lab, and millions of specimens. Deep in the back, there's an immense archive, and it's in here I meet Darren Tankey, a senior technician. Darren's story reminds me of Al. Both were outsiders without official credentials. Darren, a kid who ran away from home, a teenager barely out of high school with no money, no training, but he had the guts to ask a world-famous paleontologist for a job. And that paleontologist was a young Phil Curry. And then I was out of school and nowhere to go, so I, I wrote to Phil Curry and said, give me a job. And he said, well, I can't, but would you consider being a volunteer? And so on July 6, 79, I hopped on the Calgary Transit bus to go to the Greyhound bus terminal and almost didn't make it. The woman behind the wheel knew I was running away from home. And I just saw my whole career just flying out the window and, and, and it's like, no, I'm going on a dinosaur dig. And of course that sounded pretty ludicrous. So waving my rock hammer, if I was running away from home, would I be carrying this? This was it, his big break. It turns out that Darren would become the key to Al's discovery. Without Darren, Al's bones were headed for the landfill. Without Darren, one of Phil's biggest discoveries may not have happened. Darren still has a boyish energy, the kind of guy who spends his lunch break reading old field notes. And one day, he came across Phil's. On a coffee break, I was in our library and realized that we had old field notes from Philip J. Curry. And I flipped this page, and all of a sudden he starts talking about dinosaur bones in Grand Prairie and horned dinosaur bones. And he's even got some... Um, they're simple drawings, but they're enough to show you that they are truly, in fact, horned dinosaurs uh, from Grand Prairie. Now, this was exciting to me because at that point in time, it was common knowledge amongst the paleontological community that there were little, if any, dinosaur bones to be had in Grand Prairie. And here, Phil had drawn specimens from a collection made by a man named Al Acusta. So, I immediately wrote to him, and we arranged to go see the site. There was discussions about disposing of the paleontology collection, including the Al Acousta collection, so I became rather worried, and I rushed over to the museum in Grand Prairie and asked them, you know, uh, what was going on, and they, they said, no, we're not throwing any of the fossils away, but I wanted to see the collection just to be sure in my mind that it was still there and safe. And so he came, we went over to the museum, had a look at some of the uh, material, and uh, he was really excited at that point, uh, particularly about one uh, uh, piece of, uh, of bone that was quite significant. It was almost triangular shape, but this size, like that. And I had no idea what in the world that could be. As one of the museum employees walked me to the shelving units where the Lacusta collection was stored, my eyes were diverted to the right. On a table was a gigantic piece of rock with bones sticking out of it. And as I got closer, the museum person came back and said, oh, nice vertebra, huh? And I said, this is not a vertebra, and, but, but I wasn't sure what it was. So I flipped it over and then was astounded to see that it was the nasal boss the big growth of bone atop the snout of a Pachyrhinosaurus. So at that moment, I was able to put two and two together and realize that the Pipestone Creek bone bed contained the abundant remains 
of Pachyrhinosaurus, which at that point in time was the rarest horned dinosaur in the world. So the significance of the Pipestone Creek site that Al Acusa had found was immediately apparent that this was a, a very, very important site that needed to be investigated further. Word got back to Phil, and he assembled a crew and headed up to Pipestone Creek in Grand Prairie. Ten years after Al was shut down, the site was reopened. So by the time we went up there in 1985, we knew we were going to be dealing with Pachyrhinosaurus, and that was pretty cool because it was pretty evident from the material that had been collected already by the school teacher, Al Acusta, that uh, there were multiple individuals, and this was a big bone bed. I keep hearing about bone beds, but I don't really know what it means. So I arranged to meet Phil and Eva at a dig with their students. Um, so when you're working on a bone bed, it's a very different game than collecting a dinosaur skeleton. And yet from bone beds, we get much more information than we get from single dinosaur skeletons. Maybe not about anatomy on the initial, uh, well, what does the animal look like? But from the bone bed, we get animals that are different sizes. We get all the variation that's in the population. So we're looking at, in most cases, single gene pools. We're looking at a population of dinosaurs that are all, you know, at some level related to each other. And consequently, you can understand things like uh, variation between the juveniles and the adults, variations between males and females, individual variation, because like humans, every animal looks a little bit different than even its brothers and sisters do. And so bone beds provide some absolutely amazing information that we can't necessarily get from just looking at a single dinosaur skeleton. I check in with Eva. She's found a fossilized pine cone. So I ask her, what was it like here 70 million years ago? Yeah, some of the things that are very different from now uh, to the time of when the Pegorhinosaur bone bed uh, was sort of deposited, if we can talk about it as a death community, is that um, you have to realize there were no grasses in the Cretaceous. But um, there were lots of ferns. In, uh, in Pipestone, I have seen that there are a fair bit of uh, conifers as well. There is also quite a bit of flowering plants. I spend the day with the students, hunched over bones, brushing away dirt. It's quiet, serious work. And that's when I realize I'm sitting in a graveyard. This is where these animals died, and their bodies are being uncovered for the first time in 70 million years. One of the students finds a T-Rex tooth. It's huge. Something bad happened here. But what was it? Why did the herd die all together and all at once? After five years of digging, a dozen skulls, and thousands of bone fragments, Phil and Darren head to the lab to solve the mystery. Once, once we get a dinosaur out of the field, it goes back to the lab, and uh, as much time as it takes to take a dinosaur out, it probably takes 10 times the, the amount of time to do the preparation on that dinosaur. In the shop, the technicians do two kinds of work, removing single skeletons embedded in rock, like the ones from Dinosaur Provincial Park, and assembling smashed bones, like the ones from the bone bed at Pipestone Creek. The bones were very much like if you took a china plate and dropped it on the ground, you get 10 or 20 nice, hard, sharp pieces that fit back together quite nicely. You assemble the pieces back together. Now, some are easy, like you could get a whole rib in five pieces. So it's pretty easy to glue that back together. But some of the larger skull bones came out in perhaps 150 pieces. So you just start fitting all the pieces together and, and gluing them. And there's a time when you just can't get any more fit. So you just have to walk away from it for a couple hours or go to bed. And when you get up the next morning, you start again. And lo and behold, lots more pieces fit together. As you prepare specimens over and over and over again, you, you begin to learn their anatomy really well. And when you see something that doesn't jibe with what you've seen before, it's worthy of closer investigation. Phil and Darren had a hunch that they were looking at a new species, and that's a big deal. You identify a new species and you get to name it. But they still had a problem. 
What did the animals look like? After all, they only had the bones. And this is where the speculation comes in. This is where the creativity begins. And this is where Phil shines. You know, the, the, the early idea was that Pachyrhinosaurus had a boss on its nose, and that's because when you look at the skull, there's just a big lump of bone, and it doesn't come to a point. But um, once you understand the uh, growth on this animal, what you see is that the babies, in fact, do have a horn on the nose, and they have a horn over each eye as well. So in a way, they look very much like a Triceratops baby. It's when they get older that they change. And what happens is that the um, horn suddenly starts to turn into a big mass of bone on the nose and one over each eye. And consequently, when you look at what's left in the adult is just a mass of bone on the face. And um, one thing that struck me early on was that um, it's a very strange thing to do. I mean, uh, why would you want to turn your face into a battering ram? And it struck me that uh, this is very, very much like what we see in rhinoceros. Uh, a rhino has a massive boss of bone on its face. And that boss of bone is not the horn. It's the base for the horn. The horn is actually made out of keratin. It's a derivative of skin and hair or fingernails. That's keratin as well. It seems to me that in all likelihood, the bossa bone, in fact, is supporting a very large keratinous horn. And that keratinous horn is something that's lighter and tougher um, than it would have been if it had bone running inside of it. And um, how do you prove it, though, is, is the big problem. Keratin very rarely preserves. Other paleos disagree with Phil. The debate was so heated that the Tyrell replaced the heads on the models outside of the museum. Today, there's no horns. Phil tells me that he really doesn't care whether it had a horn or not. He's more interested in where the questions might lead. And this is why Phil is a star in the paleo world. He has the imagination and the guts to take leaps of faith. Having a good imagination is important for a scientist too, because then you start looking at the possibilities. And uh, when the ideas started getting out there that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, that they moved in herds, that they were intelligent and so on, then people would say, no, that can't be, that's wrong, because... But then people would then look at it again and say, well, actually, uh, if you look at it from this direction instead, uh, there is evidence that shows that maybe it's right. And so this back and forth that you have in science is, uh, you know, most people think that scientists are crazy because we never agree with each other. Well, that's part of the process. And uh, it's this argument and debate that allows us to move ahead. I follow Darren into the archives where he shows me the final assembled skull. And then Darren shows me one more amazing discovery, a baby dino's frill. So what we have here are large portions of the frill of Pachyrhinosaurus from young animals and adults. Um, this is the midline of the frill right here. And these on the back corners of the frill are the two big frill spikes and two smaller horns coming together. Now in the younger animal, this is the same area represented here. So this is the midline here you can see that there's no horns coming together and the big frill spikes off to the sides are just these little low, lo little low knobs. Um, when the animals are small, the frill's really thin, and when the animal's an adult, the frill is greatly thickened as well. So if we just lay these two on top of each other here, you can see how dramatic a change the uh, animal undergoes in that region of the skull. A lot of people look at bone beds, you know, it's just a lot of bones, but and they think a whole skeleton tells you more, but actually a bone bed tells you way more. Like, sure, everything's broken apart, and 
but you can rebuild the story of what's going on and um, these specimens on their own, if you just found this on its own, it would not tell you about the change that it would undergo later in life. Like if this animal had lived another couple years, it would have developed this giant frill with um, massive horns on the edge. But this animal met its end prematurely. And so it never got to reach adults, adult stage. But through its death at a, as a younger animal, we now know how they looked when they were small and how they changed as they reached adulthood. And we could not do that just on isolated specimens. So that's one reason the, the bone bed at Pipestone Creek is so significant. But the big question remained, how did the herd die? I check in with Phil to see if he has any evidence or theories. There, there's no doubt at all that most paleontologists consider themselves as detectives. <laughs> and it's one of the more fun aspects of being a paleontologist. I mean, you're, you're essentially looking at ancient crime scenes. You're trying to interpret what went on, whether it's a single skeleton or a mass death site where hundreds of skeletons are buried in the same place. You're still looking through all of the evidence that you have and you're trying to solve a crime that happened some time ago. For a paleontologist, this is something that happened millions and millions and millions of years ago and the clues are very cold and it's very difficult to make those interpretations. Nevertheless, there are clues and uh, you look through all the evidence and you're constantly looking for new evidence that uh, may point in the direction of answering how did this happen? How did this animal or these animals end exactly here? There was a lot of violent ways to die during the Cretaceous period. In some of the bone beds, they found a layer of charcoal, so maybe a forest fire killed them. Many of the bone beds are on rivers. Maybe there was a stampede and the animals drowned. But mixed in with the bones, Darren and Phil find T. rex teeth. Could a pack of predators have taken them all down? Seventy million years later, on a long weekend in 2012, a bunch of drunks stumbled upon the dig site and smashed a perfectly preserved skeleton. Why did they do it? Maybe they were sending the scientists a message. You're not welcome here. They were never found and the fossil was completely destroyed. So now it seems like the sites aren't safe and there's nowhere to store the bones, and the bones that were already collected were in this rinky-dink, unheated cabin. Al's bones needed a new home, and it was time for Northern Alberta to get its own dinosaur museum. So the community in Grand Prairie banded together to raise the money. It took close to a decade, but they made it happen. And this is what I love about Alberta. There is a get it done spirit, a sense that you can build something from the ground up, a coming together with a common goal. 
Meanwhile in the lab, Phil and Darren were working away on the scientific paper about Al's find, but this one was taking forever. However, as we prepared more specimens, of course we found more interesting things, and uh, that would delay things because then we would want the next bone so that we could tell what it was. So by the time uh, the paper came out, we were talking uh, 20 years later. And uh, it was certainly one of the longest uh, papers I've ever worked on. But uh, it was worth it. I mean, we had uh, juveniles, we had adults. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of information that we'd never seen before in any other ceratopsian bone bed. As they worked, something seemed different about Al's find. It might even be unique. If Al's discovery was a new species, it would go from interesting to groundbreaking. It's a big deal that careers are founded on. Darren and Phil compared the skulls to two other Pachyrhinosaurus herds, and after 25 years of study, they concluded that Al's bones were a whole new species of ceratopsid. This is the type specimen. When a new species is erected, you have to have the most complete and um, uncrushed specimen that you can have and that becomes the type specimen, and then all other specimens are compared against it in the future. When you discover a new species, you earn the naming rights. Now, it's usually named after the lead scientist, Phil, in this case, but Darren had an inspired idea. Um, I got called up to Phil Curry's office uh, here in, I think it was 87, and asked if I would like to contribute to this monograph, and I said yes, but whatever it turns out to be, whether it's new genus or, you know, a different species of Pachyrhinosaurus, we name it after Al. The, the only problem was keeping it a secret from Al for the better part of 25 years, I think. <laughs> Al was invited to the launch of the publication. It was a big deal in Grand Prairie. The room was packed. So we, did a, we had a big event in Grand Prairie where we announced the name of the animal. And Al was there. I don't think he even knew. I got an email from Dr. Curry that said they're, they're going to be up here in Grand Prairie on a particular day because we're going to uh, release the publication and whatnot. And my wife and I were at the college that evening in the auditorium and Dr. Curry was there and he wound up calling me up and I thought he might, you know, as the discoverer. And uh, he's talking about a number of things and, and he said, and lifted up the publication, he said, and we now have a new name for it, Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae. <laughs> and that just shocked me. I didn't expect it to be, to be named after me. I just remember a big roar out of the crowd and an applause, because they all do Al Lacusta. A lot of them were students of his. Everyone knows that he found that site and reported it, so it was a natural fit for, for the species to be named after him. It just shows that ordinary people can make extraordinary finds. It took more than 30 years, but Al was finally vindicated. He went from being labeled a poacher to being a local legend. The Lacustai name is safe forever. No matter how people want to interpret those bones, and it'll always be Lacustai. Phil also pointed out, you know, you're one of the uh, truly few people who isn't a professional paleontologist to have a dinosaur named after him. So I thought that's remarkable and the fact that, uh, that it makes me uh, go down in history is a good thing. Meanwhile, the museum was about to open. It was originally called the River of Death and Discovery Museum, quite possibly the worst name for a museum ever. So as the grand opening approached, the board reached out to Phil. Would he be willing to have his name on the museum? It's an odd request. After all, most are named after dead people. And in August 2016, the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum opened to a sold out crowd.
the Bones is a story about underdogs. And when I began this journey, I wasn't expecting to have to confront mortality, deep time, or to have to pick a side, the pros versus the amateurs. But who gets to make a discovery? Who gets the credit? Who's qualified? Who's legal? Al was shut down, embarrassed and demonized, but it was the pros, Darren, Phil, Eva, and dozens of other paleontologists and technicians who picked up the trail. Because curiosity is what science is all about. Science needs the pros and the amateurs. Nowadays, Al's a bit of a celebrity in town. There's even an annual Al Lacusta Day. Darren's writing a series of biographies on the unsung heroes of paleo in Alberta. Phil and Eva continue to explore the Pipestone site and Dinosaur Provincial Park, leading teams of students and paleontologists from all over the world. In recent years, uh, since coming to the University of Alberta, we've gone back and reopened the Pachyrhinosaurus bone bed, and uh, we're finding still more interesting things. The bone bed is anything but depleted. There, there's still bones coming out of that bone bed that um, you look at them and you say, wow, <laughs> that's a little different. I didn't expect that. We're still just working on the tip of the iceberg. And me? In the end, I went on five digs. I traveled all over Alberta, and by the end, I felt part of the paleontology community, a generous and passionate group that wants to understand the nature of life on Earth and our place within it. I've also learned a lot from the dinosaurs, holding their bones and standing on the spots where they died. I've learned that humans are only a blip on Earth's timeline and that catastrophe is the way life goes. We're part of a much larger and much longer ecosystem. And in spite of all the doom and gloom, all of those dinosaurs that died, no matter what happens, life persists. Life finds a way. <laughs>